So this we're taking up S1 H145. I use the use of force uh, bill that um, seeks to amend the bill that we did last year um, <clears throat> during the interim session on use of force. I would let Bryn kind of walk us through um, H145 H um, as passed by the House representatives. And it starts out with um, standards for law, law enforcement use of force <clears throat> with a whole bunch of definitions. So okay. we could also identify where we differ from last year's okay. 119. If you could. Sure thing. So um, good morning, committee. For the record, Bryn here from Legislative Council. Um, I did send Peggy a document this morning that um, is the bill as passed by the House with um, some notes in the margins that show how the bill differs from Act 165, which was the bill you worked on last year, uh, creating the standards for law enforcement use of force. Um, and this bill, I'll just point out <clears throat> while everybody's pulling that up. Oh, actually, would you like me to share my screen? And I can- Yeah, why don't you do that? Okay. All right, can everybody see? Yes. That? Yep. Okay. Okay, so H145 is the bill um, that amends Act 165 uh, that was passed last year. And it also amends some provisions that were passed in Act 147. Um, you might remember that bill also is uh, dealing with um, the professional conduct chapter for law enforcement. So um, I'm just going to start. Just, out. just a second, Bryn. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at what uh, at the hard copy that was mailed to us. That probably doesn't include the notes because I just sent Peggy the document this morning. So okay. If you and he sent the official copy. So all the beginning is crossed off. You have to go to page eight. To right, I, I did. And um, one second. I got to go to this. It's too. also posted on the website if you want to look at it that way. Okay, I see. So it's actually bottom of page seven. Yeah. Where it starts. Okay. Yeah. I'm yeah. good. Okay. So if people are looking at hard copy documents, I'll just you know point out where the changes are. Um, but if you want to look at your screen and see the see the marked up version I I created, you can just look at your screen. So I just want to start out by saying that um, the H one forty five really um, creates two policy changes from Act one sixty five as it was passed, and the first is that it changes um, prohibited restraint. If you remember, prohibited restraint was that um, phrase that we defined in several different sections of law. Changes that definition. Um, first of all, it changes prohibited restraint to chokehold, and it changes the definition of what a chokehold is. Um, and I will go through that at the beginning. And the other um, policy change that's made is that within the standards, if you remember, um, the standards that passed in Act 165 did not contain a specific um, prohibition on the use of a prohibited restraint, but it defined it as prohibited restraint. And in Act One or in H145, there is a specific provision that says the law enforcement is um, shall not use a chokehold unless it is justified um, pursuant to the standards. So those are the two substantive policy changes that are made here. There's also a technical correction that's made, and also there's some shuffling around of the order of the language in the standards. So I just want to set the stage here for what the, what the differences are, because you're, this is going to look like all new language, but because it's all underlined. Um, but because these standards haven't taken effect yet, what we have to do is we have to repeal them entirely and reenact them in totality. So you're not going to see any uh, strike throughs or anything like that in the standards. It's just going to look like all new language. Is that clear to everybody? Um, okay. Didn't didn't the standards take effect? They are scheduled to take effect on July 1st of this year. Got it. Okay. 
Okay. So that was, that took a while for, um, on the other body, we had some, we, we had to, because of all of the new members, there was kind of a lot of explanation of, of, of why this looked like totally new language, but it wasn't. Um, okay, so section one, first of all, we've got right here, first definition is the definition of chokehold. And can everybody see, I tried to make the font as big as possible. Um, yes. Right yep. here on the right is the um, is prohibited restraint as it was defined in Act 165. So here is the new definition of chokehold. Use of any maneuver on a person that employs a lateral vascular neck restraint, carotid restraint, or other action that applies any pressure to the throat, windpipe, or neck <coughs> in a manner that limits the person's breathing or blood flow. So um, this definition is somewhat more streamlined than the definition um, from Act 165. If you can see over here, I'll just read it just in case you can't see. The old definition from Act 165 is use of any maneuver on a person that applies pressure to the neck, throat, windpipe, or carotid artery that may prevent or hinder breathing, reduce intake of air, or impede the flow of blood or oxygen to the brain. <clears throat> So the House did hear some testimony from various witnesses, including um, a witness from Mad Freedom Vermont, that that definition was a little clunky. Um, it may create some uh, elements that aren't necessary. So um, there was a recommendation that the committee take a look at the definition of chokehold that was passed in the Massachusetts police reform bill in December. Um, and so some of this language comes from that Massachusetts definition, but it really is kind of a blended, um, a blended definition between the Massachusetts version and um, the Vermont version. I'm gonna keep going unless I see questions. So the rest of the definitions on this first page are the, exactly the same as they were in Act 165. If I'm gonna scroll down to page two, I'm now at totality of the circumstances and you can see in yellow, I've highlighted in yellow, um, additional language that was did not appear in Act 165. And this I'm calling a technical correction because I don't think it was the intent of the committees to not include um, the conduct of the person or persons involved in the definition of totality of the circumstances. I think that was inadvertently omitted. So that, this just um, makes, sure that the totality of the circumstances includes uh, the conduct of the person or persons involved in the law enforcement um, interaction. Not only the actions of the law enforcement officer leading up to the use of force. Okay, I'm going to keep going down. Now we're in subdivision B. This is the, um, remember, these are the standards that uh, govern police use of force generally. Yep. And the ch only change here is that B1 is now the language that used to appear in B4. So you'll remember this is really that significant um, section that deals with, that provides what is the um, analysis that's going to be used for a law, law enforcement officer's use of force. This is that objectively reasonable standard. So this was moved up from B4 um, to make it clear that this is the standard that the court is going to use in, anal in analyzing police use of force and to also make it sort of mirror the way section subdivision C is set up. And you remember that's the subdivision that deals with the police use of deadly force. That analysis, um, how the analysis takes, takes place is set out right in C1. So we're doing the same thing here with B. All of this, language is the same. None of this has changed at all from um, Act 165. So unless you want to go through it again, I'm just going to keep going. So now I'm on page four, and this um, language that appears in B7, a law enforcement officer has a duty to intervene when the officer <clears throat> observes another using a chokehold on a person. This language used to appear in C6 in Act 165, but it was moved up um, to the subdivision B that deals with the use of force generally. Now I'm moving on to subsection C, use of deadly force. Here is the standard. Remember law enforcement is only justified in using deadly force if um, the, that force is objectively reasonable and necessary to defend um, human life. This is all the same language as appeared in Act 165. But now here on page five, this is the new subdivision that I mentioned earlier, 
Um, this is the new language that provides law enforcement shall not use a chokehold uh, unless deadly force is justified pursuant to that C one through four, which are the standards governing law enforcement use of deadly force. So those are all of the changes that were made um, to the law enforcement standards for use of force in Act 165. And the rest of the bill um, amends both another, another section of law that was in Act 165 and then a few sections of law that were that passed in Act 147. And these are pretty straightforward because essentially what the, what the bill does is it just changes that definition of prohibited restraint to chokehold throughout the various um, statutes where prohibited restraint appeared. I have a question about chokehold. Um, is this just for law enforcement officers or does it include workers with DMH, DOC, DCF, anyone else who's dealing with people who is either contracted with or works for the state of Vermont? Are they under the same provision regarding chokeholds no, so in the use I of believe restraint? This, I and, believe, okay. Yeah, and so I, I'm concerned here that we're setting up a special standard for law enforcement to use this as a restraint. And then we have, as last I knew, they were still looking at charges for several workers at the um, uh, former Woodside program who yeah. allegedly used improper restraints. They're looking at they were looking at criminal charges. I haven't heard the res resolution of that. So I, I just wonder if we're setting up a, du a dual standard here, or a double standard, or whatever you want to call it. Right. So the definition this applies to law enforcement officers is defined in 20 VSA 2351A, and that includes um, Department of Public Safety, <laughs> State Police, Capitol Police, Municipal Police constable, motor vehicle inspectors, um, Department of Liquor and Lottery who exercise law enforcement powers, investigator employed by the Secretary of State, Board of Medical Practice investigator employed by the Department of Health, investigators employed by the Attorney General or a state's attorney, fish and game wardens, sheriffs, deputy sheriffs, railroad police officers, um, police appointed to UVM police services, and the provost marshal or assistant provost marshal of the National Guard. So it would not apply um, to those other individuals you mentioned. Well, um, Could I ask I a think, question about that? Well, I still haven't had, you know, I still, I would like to know before we go much further here, what are the standards that the Department of Corrections uses? What are the standards that D DCF uses and what DMH uses? for their employees or for contractors with the state that provide services. Now, I don't think you can have, you can say, well, law enforcement can use a chokehold, but if you're a worker at the Department of Corrections and you use a chokehold, you're going to jail. Could, could I ask a question about that? Sure. Are they, um, since this limits it to um, the, instance where it might, um, where deadly force is justified, are those other people ever, ever allowed to use deadly force? I mean, I think that's the distinction here is that law enforcement officers are in a position at times to use deadly force. And I'm not sure that a DCF worker would ever be in a position to use deadly force. I don't know. Um, in a, um... A restraint at a correctional facility, I guess one can argue. Right. So the, I mean, I've, I've, as I've said, when we walked through um, Act 165, this, these standards really operate in conjunction with the justifiable homicide statute, which applies for law enforcement officers, that same list of law enfor enforcement officers that yeah. I just mentioned. Um, so that may be another, another way to think about it. Okay, well, Bryn, um, a question about, I'm, I'm on the uh, highlighted portion, subsection six, um, and that's pretty clear, but I'm wondering, um, does anything in how the bill is restructured now change 
uh, either the criminal penalties or the professional penalties that were in place, those remain as they were? Yes, those remain. And that's what we're going to get go through now. Um, as I mentioned, those professional penalties, nothing changed about the penalties, only the definition of, of prohibited restraint was changed to chokehold. So okay. to the extent that that definition is different. Um, okay. So I'll, I'm going to keep going here and just jump to sec section two. This is the law enforcement use of chokeholds now from prohibited restraint. This is the crime that was established um, in Act 147. So again, the change here is just the definition of chokehold. Um, and also I've highlighted this here that um, this is to make it clear because you've included in the standards that a law enforcement officer can't use a chokehold unless it's necessary um, in defense of human life. We've added this provision in um, that section of the of the crime that provides law enforcement um, who employ a chokehold in violation of the standards um, can be prosecuted under the statute if um, serious bodily injury or death results. I'm going to keep going to section yeah, three. Please. Okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is that provision from Act 147 about um, that provides that the Criminal Justice Council shall not offer or approve any training of uh, prohibited restraints. This is just changed that to chokehold. And the corresponding definition is um, later in the so bill. I, and another I, do have, I do have a question about that. So if, if this is going to make this explicitly an allowable use of force in the last instance to prevent death or um, death of another person. And it's gonna range it with, you know, use of say a firearm, which is another option for use of deadly force. We train people in the use of a firearm. Um, so was there any um, attempt to try to say we need to be training people in the use of a chokehold if it's going to be an allowable use of force in the one instance, because mm -hmm. that's that's a uh, mm -hmm. it's seeming contradiction to me. Because what <clears throat> what we're doing here is we're 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 not precisely making it not prohibited, but we are saying that there's an instance where it would be legal to be used. Um, but we're continuing to say here it can't be trained. Um, and so I'm, I'm just wondering, does, did that strike anyone in the House as potentially yes. contradictory? Yes, it did. There were um, members of the committee that raised that point. Um, because I, I was glad we got the prohibition on training the chokehold. Um, and one of the reasons for that was, uh, you know, the officer who um, is charged with killing George Floyd um, as I remember, had trained in the use of the chokehold, and that would be part of the defense. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to change the provision on training, but it, it seems to me that it sets up at least an argument for someone to make, well, if not now, the next year, because it seems as though the House has no problem coming back year after year on this bill, so I, I just want to raise that as something for us to think about. Mm -hmm. I think that's important to think about. Um, yeah. We're not going to train you on it, but that's where accidents happen. Well, if you've had no training, how do you how do you know that you're doing it in a way to cause the least damage? I mean, I. I don't understand how you could, how we can justify using it as, as deadly force, but not uh, train on a proper way of doing it. I don't I don't get that. I, I think we've identified two issues for some of the witnesses that may want to that the committee is concerned about. One is I personally am concerned about particularly. Department of Corrections, there have been cases where DOC workers' lives have been in danger. 
Um, and um, they're accused of using restraints that ended up in the death of one individual, at least I can remember way back when, was David Carringer. Um, so their use of restraint and their use of other, uh, what are their standards? Secondly, um, and it may also, I'm, I'm thinking of the Woodside workers who are now under um, scrutiny at least, and I haven't heard the results of that of possible criminal charges for improper use of restraints. What are we training them in? How does that mix? And then this issue of whether or not uh, it makes sense to allow a chokehold, but then not allow anybody to train. Mm -hmm. um, so it, we've identified two major issues for the committee, I think, thus far. Um, maybe it's just me on the on the other agencies. Well, I would. I would say uh, just quickly that you know we had we had two sessions of work on on the related bills 119 and 219 and we were we came back twice or three times to the issues and we worked out something that I that I thought worked well last last session um, so it doesn't surprise me that if we come back to it again and take out a piece here or a piece there, other pieces start to fall. And that's, I think, what concerns me is we're, we're now on a path toward moving back toward the use of the chokehold um, in, in very limited circumstances, but then that has repercussions for the ban on training. And, um, you know, Mr. Chair, we've had um, back and forth in appropriations about funding the training and why we needed to wait and I, I suspect that this was part of the need to wait was to try to change the training so that it can include chokeholds. Um, but we, Sherlock, oh, we can ask the witnesses, um, <laughs> but that's a, that's a, a fear I have um, is that we wind up successively undoing uh, more than we think we're undoing. Commissioner Sherling, um, did you want to comment um, you're, you're scheduled as the next witness, but if you wanted to come in, I see your hand up. Can we take this down now? Uh, uh, I we think... might then go into the bill, so. Uh... Oh, oh, you're not done yet. Okay, no, sorry. We have, I mean... two, we have two or three more sections. Okay. Um, <clears throat> do you want me to keep going, or do you want well, to I'm, uh, sure. Commissioner Sherling may have had a comment regarding what we were just talking about. I wanted to give him an opportunity to speak. I'm happy to do it uh, during testimony if necessary, Senator. I just <coughs> thought it might inform uh, the committee's current discussion uh, relative to training. Um, just yep. two quick things. Um, one, uh, the request for uh, training funds that we uh, had in place or have in place and the timeline for training have nothing to do with trying to create uh, training around um, chokeholds. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, the reason that we believe we can um, th that this would be fine without uh, with a ban on training. Uh, now you may hear from other folks that there are some advantages to to doing the training, which go along the lines of some of the things the committee members observed. Um, that in the uh, rare, very rare instance, um, I should be really clear. Um, they're so rare that we're not able to find records um, of chokeholds being used as a, a uh, a substantive method of restraint. So um, this is not something that happens with any frequency whatsoever. Um, but that said, uh, you may hear from others that there are, uh, there are some uh, benefits to training. Um, the Department of Public Safety's position is, um, as written, we do not need, we don't believe we need to train uh, on chokeholds because they would be an improvised technique if lethal force was necessary, in much the same way that hitting someone with a vehicle, striking them with a flashlight, hitting them with a rock, uh, hitting them with a two by four, all would be permissible um, uses of lethal force while not part of training in an instance where you're fighting for your life. So it would be likened to that. I'll stop okay. there and pick up the I, rest I, later. I appreciate that. Yeah. Hey, thank you.
Why don't we go on to section four, the justifiable homicide? Okay, <clears throat> so this section is um, the same as it appeared in um, Act 165, except for a couple of changes. And if you remember, these changes aren't going into effect. They're scheduled to go into effect July 1, which is when the standards are scheduled to go into effect. Um, so the changes here are just that we've corrected the cross-references um, right. in the provision that law enforcement is um, guiltless if they use force in accordance with the standards. Section five, this is that um, section that appeared in Act 147 that adds conduct to Category B misconduct in Title 20 Unprofessional Conduct Chapter. And as I mentioned before, this just changes the prohibited restraint definition to the new definition of chokehold. So going back to in um, 23051, um, if it's a forceful event, suppression of a person attempting to commit murder, sexual assault, doesn't matter who it is, right? Right. It, could, it doesn't need to be your parent, your child. I'm thinking of the case where we, uh, some of you may have seen in New York City, the Asian woman age 65 being stomped and punched while, while two uh, security guards evidently were just watching and did call 911, but didn't make any attempt to stop the beating of the woman. Would this, this would still allow them to go and to try to um, suppress that person? Yes, this would have excused their conduct. Okay, so it, it doesn't take, sense. it doesn't need to be the person's spouse or no. parent or child. Okay. No, there's no restriction. Right. Of, In B2, I'm, are you looking at B2, forceful or violent suppression of a person attempting to commit? Yes. Yeah, I'm looking at B2 because the, actually this morning, um, in the press, there's quite a bit of criticism of the two security guards who were just watching, including some from the mayor of New York City. Can I ask, um, this is maybe a, a little off topic, but is it really the case that if I murder somebody who's burglarizing someplace, if they don't have a weapon, um, I can kill them? And there's no penalty for me. You mean you as I, a person? Uh, yes. Yeah, it says if a person kills or wounds, he shall be guiltless if I'm suppressing somebody who's burglarizing or robbing. So that means I can just kill somebody who comes into my house to rob it, whether they're armed or not. I always thought it was equal amounts of force. If they were armed, you could use armed force. But this makes it seem like it's open season on somebody if they're in the act of robbing. Well, how would you know if they were armed? Well, I'm, I'm just saying, like, are, it, it seems as though in our law, if somebody's robbing, even if they're robbing a small amount, you can kill them. That, that seems a little medieval to use, uh, <laughs> is that right, Bryn? Um, so that's the, that's I wouldn't the, say it's medieval. Don't ask Bryn if it's medieval. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't gonna answer that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of like, I don't know. Anyway. I think if off, somebody's off breaking topic. into, so, somebody's breaking into one's home, one shouldn't have to ask if they're armed in order to, suppress yeah. the the act of well but it doesn't or, it doesn't you, you don't know if a burglary is going to result in an aggravated sexual assault sexual assault murder etc it doesn't say in your home it's not home invasion it's if i witness somebody burglarizing or robbing i can kill them that's what it says I guess. okay so that so, that's a, that is how the um justifiable homicide statute currently reads Right, yeah. and we we took out a bunch of other um, foolish language. No, right, this right ma master, way. mistress. Sister, yeah, um, I, I'm just sermon. flagging it. Like maybe at some other point, we want to think about. You know, I believe does there burglary, are. Other... Does burglary imply it's into a place 
or robbing doesn't. Robbing doesn't, but burglary, I think, implies that it, I think the definition of burglary is. There's burglary into an occupied dwelling. Um, yeah. Oops. It, it's it's maybe, helpful, uh, yes, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I, yes, uh, Commissioner um, Shirley. Robbery uh, implies um, uh, violence as being um, is part is part and parcel of the crime. Um, burglary does not, and as Bryn just pointed out, there's burglary to an occupied residence, and you can have burglary to other uh, structures, including things like sheds. We actually flagged this as the review was happening last year that as written justifiable homicide would allow a homeowner to uh, kill or seriously injure a person who's burglarizing their shed. So there is a loophole here um, for uh, certain types of structures that you might want to clean up. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I, I just pointed out there. You could say an occupied dwelling. I would think. And you can have burglary to other uh, structures, including Oop. things like sheds. We actually we're, we're getting a playback. Somehow. Yeah. somehow, Commissioner, your testimony somebody's, is playing back. No, it, Huli, it said somebody's it watching on our YouTube. Oh, all right. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I just want to. We should flag burglary. Um, and robbery, then. maybe too. Well, I'm you know I'm thinking of a kid I used to deal with who be your own person claimed, claimed that he just leaned up against the shed and the door opened so he went in and took the stuff but it wasn't his fault the door opened well that and there was a, a note saying take the stuff yeah <laughs> if the door hadn't opened when he leaned up against it it wouldn't have, he wouldn't have taken the stuff so it's not his fault doesn't doesn't robbery include if they were robbing a person's own body i mean they're I I think we come back to this um, and get some testimony on it. Uh, I think you, Senator, um, you <clears throat> raised a point here. Of what the open? We know what you know. What what are we referring to with burglary and robbery? What statutes in the in the green books are we referring to? Sure, we can come back with that. Um, I can also um, just send the committee the the links to the statutes for for our for robbery and burglary, if you like. Yeah, I think it also might want to make clear that it's not the group in one, unless it's, unless. Right. That, that, that two is completely different from one. It does say or. Yeah, I think, yeah. I, I think just should make it clear because all right. Uh, okay. This is section three is where um, we. Yep. Section subdivision three is where you're referring to law enforcement, um, right. the, the defense for law enforcement. And again, we've just corrected the cross references there. Yep. And so we took out all the stuff about rebellions and riots and Right. This was all. This is all what you did last year. So it's all the same, except for the for those new subdivisions. So I'm going to keep going to section five. Yep. <clears throat> um, and I think I actually walked through this already. I don't know if everybody heard that. This is that um, the title twenty unprofessional conduct. We've just changed um, what the definition is for chokeholds because that's now category B prohibited conduct. Um, section six. This is that section that um, limits the Criminal Justice Council's ability to sanction an officer for a first offense of category B conduct. And this appeared in Act 147. It carves out certain conduct from that limitation um, so that a first offense of use of excessive force, placing a person in a chokehold, or failing to intervene when another officer places a person in a chokehold um, that can all be sanctioned uh, as a first offense. That's more of a government operations issue. Yep. Uh, I mean, that was in that was in 147. So the mm -hmm. change here is simply that we're swapping out prohibited restraint from for chokehold. Okay. Um, section seven. This is the section that just deals with uh, Act 165. We've repealed the justifiable homicide and stand. 
standards from Act 165 as well as their effective date because we're recreating them here. And then another important thing to note is that um, the effective dates makes the standards for use of force for law enforcement and the justifiable homicide statute changes effective on September 1st. So we bump out the date by three months um, from Act 165. What, what was the rationale on, on that, Bryn? To give law enforcement more time to create their policy. Okay. Nice ask question. Um, so sure. in terms of just, um, if there's no training on a chokehold, although the definition is in here, um, how, do the, how does the another officer observing it know that someone's in a chokehold? I mean, other than, other than if you've been in a few fights yourself, maybe. Well, um, the definition describes what a chokehold is pretty clearly, and the definition will in all likelihood be a part of law enforcement um, policy that they will be trained on. Okay, so they will be trained on what it is. Yes. Which seems like maybe someone needs to show them, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm sure Commissioner Sherling will be glad to correct me if I have this wrong, but I, my understanding is that they are not um, currently being trained on these types of restraints and that um, I don't believe law enforcement took, uh, had, had any issue with the, that section three that prohibits the council from training on, on these types of restraints. I'm not thinking they need to be trained to know how to use it, but just do they know what it looks like? In other words, give a definition here, but do they really know what it looks like on a person? Probably, maybe everybody thinks that everybody does, but. We do anticipate, Senator, it's Mike Sherling again, um, that uh, there is a cross section of training that will occur relative to chokeholds, but not how to employ them, but how to escape them if you are in a, um, in a fight. Um, so to, to the extent that there's recognition necessary, that probably would check that box. Okay. Bryn, where is the section on um, the ban on training? Section three. Um, oh, right. Yeah, Got section it. section three. Okay. Right. Um, uh, any other questions for Bryn? Okay. Why don't we go right to uh, Commissioner Shirley, the Department of Public Safety. Commissioner, welcome. Thank you, Senator. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, I think I will be relatively brief in, uh, in terms of direct comments, but happy to answer uh, any questions. Um, we appreciate the work that's been done uh, on H-145 by the House uh, to create some additional clarity and improve upon the work that was done in Act 165. Uh, in the background, we've done uh, extensive work with a variety of partners uh, on policy development and the beginnings of uh, framing training uh, that will be an extension of Act 165 and whatever passes this session. Um, I think generally 145 brings uh, some needed clarity to, to enable the final policies to be created and the training to be uh, developed without making um, substantive alterations to the, the spirit of what was passed in 165. Um, if we, as we get into training and we engage, you know, 2000 or so uh, officers and uh, supervisors and executives on this, it's possible that we could identify um, some other areas where clarity might be needed, but we have not uh, yet. Um, we'll certainly report back if that happens. Um, with that as the backdrop, there really are um, two uh, areas where we think there could be some um, modest improvements uh, made to the language that has made it to you a total of nine words that we're uh, suggesting be added. And they both uh, fall into uh, section B, uh, subsection small b, um, sections one and five. Um, in order of importance, uh, B5, we'd like to add the words, uh, uh, if feasible, to the front of that 
Um, we talked with uh, the House Committee about this extensively. They took um, uh, testimony on it from, from others as well. Um, one of the things that happened in response to uh, that request was to uh, rearrange the paragraphs to put B1, which used to be B4, um, at the top, which we do think helps a bit. Um, Commissioner, but the Commissioner, I'm I, I can't tell where I I'm uh, yeah. page yeah I'm talking I'm lost on where page three um, of ten five if feasible when a law enforcement officer knows that a subject's conduct is a result of medical condition. Can, can you Maybe cite we, the section again and the numbers because our pages we, are different? Could we put it on the screen? Um, uh, that way. I'm, I know we can't see you. Back up. Yep. That'd be great. Senator Sears, this is Joe Benning. For some reason or other, I'm getting a message on my screen that tells me the host has blocked my video. I have no idea why we would do that. Senator we had Benning. a meeting, Joe. Mm -hmm. I think Penny did that. You, we don't like your tie. <laughs> okay. Now the co host uh -huh. says I'm supposed to start my video. Let's see how it works. I'm back. Yep, we see you again. And All you right. changed your tie, so now you're welcome. Yep. So we're, what you see on the screen, uh, what the commissioner is recommending is the words, if feasible, when a law enforcement officer knows that a subject's conduct is the result of medical condition oh. or mental impairment. So the, the reason for that request is that um, we agree with the spirit that uh, uh, if someone is impaired, um, that to the extent feasible, uh, the response to that, uh, to their behavior um, should be altered uh, if it is possible, but is not always possible. Um, I'll, I'll give you a real life example of a, a subject um, wielding a sword outside of a pharmacy um, one evening and uh, on approach, it was clear that there was some kind of an altered mental status. It's unclear what was causing that altered mental status, but it was not feasible to take into account the fact that there was an altered mental status um, in responding to that. It was a successful outcome without substantive use of force, but um, uh, that was by uh, um, you know confluence of events that allowed it to play out that way. Um, so there are instances where um, someone's impairment can directly be taken into account and we can alter a response, but there are other instances where it's not possible to do that. And as written that this paragraph could be taken alone by a court um, as a mandate that we somehow alter uh, the response, which again is not always feasible. So that's why we're asking for that um, language to be added. We don't believe it substantively changes um, the spirit and uh, how it will be implemented and certainly the policy and training will extend um, the emphasis on uh, taking those things into account and uh, ensuring that to the greatest extent feasible we're, we're making alterations. Um, but again, uh, not always uh, feasible or possible. Okay. Uh, uh, Commissioner, if, no. if I could, um, I, I think what you're suggesting renders the whole paragraph um, doubly conditional, I would say, because it's already conditional. It's, it's when a law enforcement officer knows something, which they may not. So, so in, the, in the cases where they do, and then it's, it's really the lightest possible language. They'll take that into account. Um, you know, that doesn't say very much in terms of what their ultimate conclusion needs to be, just that they need to uh, ex post facto, be able to justify what they did in terms of how it also took that into account. So it seems like by putting if feasible on the front of it, we're, again, we're making it what is already conditional, then almost, I would argue, almost uselessly conditional. Um, because the officer um, could just say it wasn't feasible, and so I didn't do it. Uh, I, I would have to disagree, Senator. I think what it does is it allows us to more clearly create policy and training. Um, and without that, um, you know, it, 
I don't know that the language as written is as conditional as you suggest. It, it says you shall take into account in determining the amount of force appropriate to use. It doesn't say how, and, and it doesn't necessarily say that you that it's optional. It says if you know that the subject's um, conduct is a result of some kind of impairment. So use this. You could use many different examples. So don't take the sword as a. I'm not trying to be flamboyant. Um, it could be uh, two by four. It could be um, it could be anything. Um, it's not clear how we're supposed to change the uh, the response, but this paragraph, as written, says you shall take the, the information into account. So if, we're trying to create know. a. If you know, and and also take what what does taking it into account mean? It means it becomes one of a potentially infinite number of factors. And maybe the other factors oh, weigh much. Rather than, um, when we come back to this after, when we get the markup of the bill, but I, um, if you want to keep going on that, uh, never mind. But never mind. When may, I get to may I ask a question about that, Senator Sears? Yeah. Where, so Commissioner, where did you suggest putting the, if feasible, at the very beginning? I would think that it would, um, Mo the, that it more rightly belongs in the uh, last um, pair, uh, phrase there, the officer shall take that information into account and that that's where, that's where it would belong. Uh, I think that's accurate, Senator. Um, shall, comma, uh, if feasible or to the greatest extent feasible or yeah. you know, maybe there's other language that threads this needle in a way that- I think I understand um, where you're going, but I think no qualifies everything here. No. Oh, and maybe it, we it doesn't? I don't think so because you could know that in the case that the commissioner gave, the example he gave, he, we knew he knew that there was an altered state, but the question is, how do you take that into account when determining the, the amount of force? So I think that's where it belongs. And it's the officer shall consider that information um, to the extent possible when, when um, determining the amount of force. Because you, you could know that they were altered and you, but, it, but it still might not. Well, I, um, I think we're getting, um, getting the cart for the horse here. Okay. Um, but I, I just point out one good example and that would be a person's in a car accident. The officer who's investigating um, leaves the person is in, impaired, <clears throat> but there's no sign of alcohol. So they take them to the drug recognition expert, which takes all this time, the person's blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, and it turns out the person has a concussion. But, That's an that actual case. Here. Yes, it does. I, it's similar. Okay. Never mind. I, I'm tired of arguing about it. <laughs> yeah. You're, yes. you're right, Senator Sears, it, it, uh, and that example could be extended to someone suffering from uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, right. which is causing an altered mental status. Um, right. and, and that's in part why we think some clarity, uh, additional clarity here would be helpful, that it appears to mandate a, uh, a pivot in action that isn't always possible. I don't disagree that it could use some Further clarification, I'm not sure if feasible is the right place to do it. And as Senator White pointed out, that may not even, you know, having it at the beginning, it might be, you know, because there are cases where you just don't know that the person su suffering from whatever. Uh, I would say that's the rule versus the exception. It actually takes uh, medical testing to determine what the, the, the origin of the altered reason mental where, status one is. One of the reasons for embedding social workers into police, into um, barracks? In part, that's true. Uh, um, I have some I, suggested language. Okay. So Fine. in the last section there, it says the officer 
shall comma as much as possible comma consider that information when determining the amount of force. I, I don't think that there's anything necessarily wrong with that, but I, I just, I think the language already says that. I, I think the, the commissioner is um, pointing it out, I think in the way that people do when there's a shall, they, they um, would prefer that it not be a shall, that it be somehow more conditional than that. But it says, all, all it mandates is that you take the information into account, which is, uh, it, it's a metaphor for saying there's an account that has numerous things and you're going to give them relative importance. So in the case of the sword, um, it doesn't matter that someone might be um, drunk. There's a sword flashing around that obliterates other considerations there. You have to defend against the sword. So taking into account doesn't demand by law a change in the appropriate use of force just that it be considered. Um, so I don't know. I, don't... I, would just, I would just offer, Senator, we're yeah. specifically not asking for the shall to be changed to a should. Right. Um, we're right. trying to find a way to, to keep the shall um, right, but, with but, the requisite modifier. Uh, but, I would right, also the, observe that. When you make it conditional, you're saying if, then, then shall. And, and that's a way of, um, it, it is a way of weakening the shell, which I, I don't, I think is already weak, very, as weak as it could possibly be, because it's just asking that the officer okay. take, take something into mental account. Okay. Can we go on to your next concerns, Commissioner? <laughs> I can, I, if I may, just one final observation, having okay. spent hundreds of hours on the witness stand, uh, uh, probably more than half of them being cross-examined because that's the nature of the way the system works. Um, I can anticipate the types of questions that will come relative to this section um, that will not uh, track directly with the committee's discussion. It will be an effort at um, trying to pin an officer down about whether they, sh whether they did not follow the shall um, and this dovetails directly into the next point, which is. Um, I, I would say this section B5, little B5, needs clarity. I concur. And I appreciate any work on it, um, including any additional suggestions Senator Bruth may have to, to keep the spirit um, without watering it down, but just creating um, the clarity we think is necessary. Um, so my final point dovetails into the uh, the other um, suggested edit we have, which is in B1, so going up three paragraphs. Um, we continue to believe that um, some language that indicates that the assessment in that section one Brian, um, could, is- Could you go up? Uh, wait. This is where the we... decision by law enforcement? Yes. Yeah. Okay that adding some language that indicates that this is without the benefit of hindsight. Um, and that is in large part because um, much of the, uh, uh, much of the existing uh, training and um, the ability to train going forward, um, it, it's becoming difficult for us to try to frame you know, how far back someone is supposed to be looking uh, in their assessment of what was objectively reasonable um, and setting up the new standard. We think that uh, ensuring that without the benefit of hindsight is important because it's, it's very easy. And we do this when we're supervising officers and often are, are guilty of being um, occasionally unreasonable with them um, saying, well, you know, two days ago, you should have done X and then maybe this wouldn't have happened. You wouldn't have lost this piece of evidence or this response wouldn't have gone this way. And there's just often, often it's very easy to, to make connections of dots appropriately or inappropriately uh, with the benefit of hindsight, but it's very difficult um, to connect those dots uh, in a fast moving situation. So we believe that uh, without the benefit of hindsight has a um, a meaningful place somewhere in this paragraph. 
does doesn't it say that it's the perspective of a reasonable officer in the same situation it does but there's no temporal restriction uh on that right now so but, but that's when folks, the same situation is maybe there's language to be added um around the the temporal definition of a situation that would address what we're concerned with here but um I mean, it, it, uh, honestly, it, it seems very clear to me, a reasonable officer in the same situation. Um, it seems like if you add in without the benefit of hindsight, that, that seems more like then you're, it sounds like a defense for the person. Um, it's, it's what a defense attorney might argue. Well, in, with the benefit of hindsight, we might have done something different. Yeah. But this is, a, this is a more objective standard, which is a reasonable officer in, in that same situation, which is the same time, place, and totality of circumstances. Um, if, that, if that would help, uh, Commissioner Sherling, to say, of a reasonable officer in the same time, place, and totality of circumstances, I, I wouldn't have a problem with that. But benefit of hindsight seems to me to edge around to a sympathetic frame for the person who's. That may, uh, I, I'll leave that assessment to um, some of our partners at the uh, uh, Attorney General's office, uh, state's attorneys and others, but that may um, that may alleviate that concern by just adding a couple of words after situation, uh, including time and place, comma, based on the totality of the circumstances that could do it. Okay. All right. Okay. Commissioner, anything else on this? No, I thought I would be brief. It didn't, uh, wasn't as brief as no, I no, hoped. No, no, it, was, it was to the extent that um, we focused on a couple of issues here. Uh, uh, I'll just flag one other thing, which is uh, now anticipating that this may not become uh, final until uh, potentially as late as May. Uh, it may make sense to look at the timeline for implementation as well. We have to, once it's final, we have to finalize the policy, um, create the training, and then deploy it to uh, roughly 2,000 people. Um, assuming May, uh, that would give us four months um, it probably could be done in four months, but it would be quite a rush to do so. Uh, so maybe some additional timeline to uh, for implementation may be helpful. Uh, we'll also defer 8B, to the- 8B, which is September 1, 2021. Um, Commissioner, I'm remembering from appropriations, we had the, we put in the overtime money. My memory was that you, your testimony was what, that if we gave you that, you could make July 1st. Um, we were in, that's correct. We were anticipating, uh, we, we thought this was going to come out on a faster timeline, um, make some edits and, and get it uh, potentially to the governor for signature um, pretty quickly. Uh, so uh, I also did testify that it's it was conceivable that we could uh, defer into 2020, I'm going to get the budget wrong, 20, the 2022 budget, um, because uh, we thought that uh, the House was looking at um, uh, extending the timeline into September. So there were some options for the General Assembly relative to funding. But our, our, I understood you now to be saying you thought you needed longer than September. I think given what we would project the timeline now to be, this becomes uh, final sometime in May, unless it gets accelerated, um, yeah. that a, a four month uh, timeline to both deploy and, uh, excuse me, develop and deploy training to that many people in so many corners of the state uh, will be challenged. Uh, again, it could be done in four months, but it will be a rush, uh, not a, um, mm -hmm. I just, I always fear when we're rushing. Okay. Well, I will say that it arrived here on 323. That's read the first time, committed to the Committee on Judiciary. This is 331. So we've had it for eight days. One could say we sat on it. 
Uh, but several of those days were taken up with other things. Um, so we're acting as quickly as we can. I can't, um, I don't know why the house took three months on it. And that's not, it shouldn't be taken as a complaint, Senator. Um, no, no, I'm just, I'm just uh, defending the Senate Judiciary Committee um, <laughs> and blaming the House Judiciary Committee if, if I must. Oh, we're getting into bad territory. No, I didn't call them any names. I just <laughs> said that we didn't get the bill until the 23rd right. of March. And this is the 31st. So we've only had it for seven days. I do have a question about that. That and other bills. If crossover was the 12th, why are we just getting bills? Because crossover is when it leaves the committee, not when it arrives oh. in the Senate. Okay. It took it that has long to be out of the committee down. by March 12th. And but then it, it took went to them the that floor. long to do okay. three li two little votes. Okay. I guess Got they it. had to talk about a lot of other stuff over there. Okay. There are 150 of them, if you remember. That's I don't know true. if it'd be appropriate to cut the size to 75 in this bill. <laughs> Maybe re in redistricting. That's I'll a good option. With, uh, I'll check with the ACLU and see how they feel about it when they're up for testimony. But um, I think the the prior speaker did, you know, nothing I've ever agreed with her more when she said there's too many of us. Uh, Julio Thompson is our next witness. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Julio, welcome. Happy New Year. I don't think we've seen you yet this year. I don't think you have me there. Uh, I'm impressed with the with your background, I must it's say. Artificial. Uh, oh, no. You ruined it. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, lawyers have a duty of uh, candor in front of public tribunals and, and hopefully everywhere. So. <laughs> uh, I was following that general duty of candor. I mean, I'm looking at Senator Bennings. He's a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, I have a that. bug crawling across the top of my iPad. That might, that in the rules of ethics, that might be deemed an overshare. <laughs> um, uh, go, good morning, uh, Julio good morning. Thompson, Assistant Attorney General and Director of the Civil Rights Unit. Um, I, I, uh, I'm available for questions. We didn't um, have any statement prepared for the bill. This was a bill, I think, that um, it was a product of some efforts of clarification from, from public safety and others. So um, I've testified a little bit on the bill. Um, I, can, I can offer some background about some of the topics that have been raised. Uh, for example, the, the issue of hindsight and, uh, and also feasibility that were raised in prior testimony, if you wish, but otherwise, I'll just I th actually I'd appreciate something on the benefit of hindsight. Sure. So um, putting aside use of force for a second, there's been in, in not just constitutional law, but other areas of law, there's um, been a doctrine of what's called hindsight bias, which is a recognition that someone who's looking backwards, if they know the outcome of, of an event or a process, they make, make judgments that the process, the events leading up to the conclusion were obvious and predictable. Um, it can happen, for example, outside of, um, of constitutional law and it is a well-established doctrine in patent law. When patent examiners look at an invention, they have to decide whether to give a patent as whether the, a process or an invention was obvious or whether it was some, it, revealed some ingenuity um, and uh, there's, there's an inherent bias that examiners have to protect against because they know the invention works. And so there's a bias for thinking, well, to this, these steps were obvious because look, it works. Um, in constitutional law, um, the doctrine really related originally to searches and it was actually uh, an effort to um, uh, to, to respond to defenses asserted by law enforcement. For example, um, you could have, let's say, uh, uh, a, uh, a student resource officer, a police officer assigned to a school who's just randomly searching backpacks. Uh, and he searches a backpack and that's the one that's challenged. And inside the backpack, uh, 
is a gun or is, uh, is, is drugs. But the facts are that at the time the officer conducted the search, you would evaluate the reasonableness of that officer's actions based upon what he, what he knew, not applying the hindsight that you know, looking back, that there was a gun in the backpack. Um, so that's really where that hindsight comes from originally. Before use of force, it had to do with searches. You would not take it to the outcome or the outcome of a, a challenge search of a car by the discovery of something you know that you learn about after the search has happened. Instead, you, you return yourself to the scene, examine what the officer knew, and evaluate the reasonableness of that. The fact that there was a gun or, or drugs in the trunk should be irrelevant to the analysis. Um, and uh, use of force is, um, applies the same standard because it's also um, evaluated under the Fourth Amendment. So you're, it's not a search, it's a seizure and the Fourth Amendment covers both. So in 1989, the Supreme Court uh, applied this, this doctrine uh, for the first time in the context of force in a case called Graham versus Connor. Um, Graham was a diabetic who uh, was had very low blood sugar and asked his friend to drive him to a convenience store to get him some orange juice. He ran into the store. It was a huge line, it was slow moving. And so uh, panicking a little bit, he ran out of the store, got back in the car, said, just drive to so-and-so's house and get some orange juice there. And he was observed by some officers from Charlotte, uh, uh, North Carolina police officers running into a store and then suddenly running out and getting into a car that speeds off. So they follow him, uh, the officers saying they thought maybe that was an indication of robbery had occurred. Uh, so there's a traffic stop. And uh, according to uh, you know, the evidence that was submitted, uh, Graham's friend is telling him, look, he's a diabetic, he needs to get some, he needs to get some sugar in his system and the officers are saying, we're gonna find out what happened at the store. And in the meantime, there's, uh, you know, there's force that's used to restrain Connor. Uh, and then he files suit for injuries he sustained by the stop. And the, the, the officers alleged in that case, well, and, and at the trial level were successful because they said, well, they were acting in good faith and they had to restrain him until they could find out what happened. And the Supreme Court says, well, we're not going to apply a good faith standard for use of force. Instead, we're going to look at the totality of the circumstances, what the officers knew at the scene, um, and evaluate whether it was reasonable as an objective matter. So your good faith doesn't come into, doesn't come into play. That's the objective reasonableness standard that's been with us in, in constitutional law for about 32 years. And then Graham, uh, what the court said, the, the kind of the, the, one of the key passages of the case is the court says, the, the reasonableness of a search must be judged from the perspective of a reasonable officer on the scene, rather than with the 2020 vision of hindsight. The calcul yeah. So anyways, that's where that hindsight language comes from. Uh, th this law basically for the use of force requires three things. One, objective reasonableness. Two, that the force be necessary. And three, that it be proportional. And I, one of the questions or, or some of the testimony in the house is with respect to that first element, objective reasonableness, uh, aren't we just articulating the Graham standard, um, which has been around and the Vermont Supreme Court applies it in the context of the state's constitution as well. Uh, and the view was, yes, it's, it's kind of gram plus two. Uh, and so I think the law enforcement um, witnesses that have testified before say, you know, we've trained that language from gram forever, um, that it is circumstances on the scene without the benefit of hindsight um, and, um, and, and it has to be reasonable in that context. Your good faith, your intentions don't matter uh, as to whether it's reasonable or not. So that's, that's a circumstance. Um, Senator Baruth had, uh, had asked the question, doesn't the statute, and I guess, I don't know if we could get the language up um, that, that for the definition of objective reasonableness, but 
uh, doesn't that already take it, doesn't the language take it into account? Uh, and I would say, uh, yes, it does. Um, maybe, I don't know, Brent's gonna do that. Um, yeah, so it's B1, if we could scroll down to B1 for a second. So here it's whether the decision by a law enforcement officer to use force uh, was a, objectively reasonable. Again, that's the language that's used in Fourth Amendment law. There's, there's over 10,000 cases uh, uh, it, you know, on, on the books about what objective reasonableness means. So it's a well-established standard. It's a term of art, uh, but it shall be evaluated from the perspective of a reasonable officer in the same situation. Now, as I would read that, an officer in the situation doesn't have the benefit of hindsight, doesn't know what's in the trunk, doesn't know whether the person that they're using force on has, you know, a, a, a knife in his pocket or whatever, unless you know, at the time the officer knew that. Um, so I think it's already there. Um, I think because this language about the perspective of the officer in the same situation and because the Graham case in the same sentence says, in the same situation without the benefit of hindsight, I think the concern from the law enforcement uh, witnesses that I heard was that our, by leaving that language out, which is really well known, uh, the, the, the without hindsight language, uh, will that create confusion in future cases where, um, where someone might argue that this isn't the Graham standard, that this isn't the, 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 the constitutional standard, but it's some other standard. Uh, so uh, our perspective is that it's strictly speaking, is it necessary? Um, but it's helpful in at least eliminating the doubt that the first of the three requirements, objective reasonableness, is the same standard that everybody's been using. What's new in the law or in the prior law is adding that necessary and proportion. That's where Vermont, uh, at least when the original legislation was proposed, that's where Vermont was raising the standard for its law enforcement professionals. So objective reasonableness is kind of the constitutional minimum. Uh, so I viewed that the language of based on 2020 hindsight is just, you know, basically importing language that's already been well settled. It's not changing the constitutional standard. But if I think of the, you know, if, if this were being argued in court, our, I think our position would be um, as written, you couldn't take into hindsight because officers on the scene don't have that, that hindsight that you do. They don't know the outcome. They don't know whether uh, the person that they're struggling with might have um, you know, uh, some illness or something that leads them to have uh, you know, a cardiac arrest or something. We would know that afterwards, but the officer in the scene would not. Uh, I'll stop there if there are any questions about that. Well, that does lead to a few questions. Um, okay. I, I think we've heard of Graham before. But it does lead me to a couple of questions. If an officer, take a case from Bennington that's already been decided by the Vermont Supreme Court, where a, um, a man was, was searched who, um, who took a cab to Bennington. Um, Bennington PD um, did a search, found drugs. Um, the man was convicted, sent to jail. Supreme Court overruled that based upon various factors. But if we put something in here based upon hindsight, would that be, you know, because he came in a cab and he was a person of color, does that make it okay to, to have done that search? If we well, make the, something explicit here, um, more explicit in terms of hindsight. Well, I, what, I guess what I'm saying- I worry about endangering what is already a standard by putting more in. Well, actually, I think the concern is that, I mean, like the language that's in the statute here, objectively reasonable, Yeah. that comes from Graham. The right, officer when, in the same circumstances comes from Graham. The, the, the concern that I heard um, in the house was that the part about 2020 hindsight without the benefit of hindsight, 
that also comes from Graham and law enforcement was asking, what is the import of your leaving that out? Like, why wouldn't you, if, if Graham in one sentence says officer in the same situation without hindsight, and you say officer in the same situation, but you leave out the phrase about height hindsight that the court used, does that mean that you're changing what objective reasonableness means under the standard? So we have, now we'll have two different standards. I think that was the concern. But well, I don't, going back to my case from Bennington that was thrown out by the Supreme Court, um, well, I, well I, I'm not familiar with that case, but, but I will tell you that Vermont Supreme Court and, and uh, Senator Benning here is much more adept at talking about uh, these issues than I am, but um, in both federal court and state court, when you're analyzing the reasonableness of the search, you don't apply hindsight. You evaluate it. It's the same standard. I mean, basically what Graham did was take the standard from searches and apply it to force, um, it's the same standard because Fourth Amendment says you'll have reasonable searches and seizures. Graham, use of force is treated as a seizure of the person. I see. But it's the same amendment. And so the court said, we use the same standard. What are the circumstances known at the time of the act, either a search or a seizure without the benefit of hindsight? Thank you. Good. Yeah, Senator White. So Julio, are you saying that we actually should put without uh, the benefit of hindsight in there because by adding, by having those two, two phrases from Graham and specifically leaving out the third phrase that it implies something different than the Graham standard? Uh, I, I think the point is that it, it, I think the concern is that it could create confusion yeah. and I do that. And um, so you and would I, I don't think it I don't think adding it creates confusion. I think it could reduce possible confusion. Okay. But I think that um uh and, and I think the court, you know, um and they're not writing statutes, although sometimes you think they are by the language mm -hmm. that they use because there's their standards are so detailed sometimes. But the court was uh, I think in that sentence really just emphasizing that when you say someone in the situation. That means we're not using hindsight. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it sort, it's sort of belt and suspenders, but it follows a long standing line of cases that really have to do um, with, uh, you know, with searches. And, and the kind of the pedigree of, of that doctrine really comes from not giving law enforcement a break if an, if an otherwise unreasonable search did, did produce the murder weapon, so to speak, that that should okay. influence your decision making. That, so that's I think, helpful I think it would me. be helpful. Yeah, that's helpful okay. to me. Thank you. Any but, other? Yeah, Sorry. and so in terms of the heightened standard for Vermont, like what is Vermont doing? That is like focusing things more on de-escalation and kind of raising the standard. Um, that really comes from the other parts of the law that talk about that force not only has to be objectively reasonable, that's grand, but also necessary and proportional. That's the new stuff. And um, I don't think there was any concern about the, the newer standard. I think the concern was that, are, are we not applying the, the constitutional minimum? And I think I think the intent was that you are, but you, it's, that, so we've been calling it gram plus two. You have to meet the gram standard plus demonstrate necessity and proportionality. Um, so that's all I, I think I have to say on that. Those are questions. Other questions for Julio? Julio, any other comments you'd like to make on this bill? Yeah, just just to go back to the feasibility issue and it, it, just to briefly address that, if you could pull up the language, if I, I don't know if, if Brent is able to do that. Because I think there was some, what I heard this morning, I think there was a little bit of confusion about what the role of the feasibility language is. Um, it was in five. B5, yeah. B5. B5. Yeah. So really, I mean, what five does, five on its face is unconditional. It's an unconditional duty. Uh, if you know something, 
you have to have two things that for for five really to uh, to apply. One, you have to know the thing. You have to have this information, and then two, it says if you have it, you have to take it into account in making your force determination. Um, and on its face, it says it, it, we would read that as without exception. Uh, so when we read shall phrases like that, from, you know, from the lawyer's perspective in the AG's office, if you added another sentence here um, that said, the above duty shall apply even if it is undisputed that it was not feasible for the officer to do so. Um, my guess is that people would not agree to that language um, because I think people would say, well, we wouldn't want to impose a legal duty when it's not feasible to comply with the duty. Uh, and so that's really, I think, that's a, another way of looking at the feasibility question. There are cases where there, there are different use of force encounters and some of them, the officer has plenty of time to make a decision. There's someone uh, who's standing, you know, who's threatening people with an umbrella at a bus, a, a bus stop and the officer's pulling up and they've got distance and they've got time to make evaluations. But there may be other use of force instances where the officer opens a door and is shot in the chest and the officer returns fire and flees. And it turns out, luckily the officer had a vest. So they survived the encounter. When they're interviewed, they ask the officer, so what was going through your mind when you fired your gun? And the officer says, uh, well, the only thing I thought of was, I think I'm shot, I better return fire and get out of here. And then in the interview, it turns out the officer knew the assailant, knew the person had a, a mental disability. But he's asked, did you think about anything else? No. Well, did you think about how his mental illness might play into your calculations? No, I, it, I, I felt, I, I thought I got shot and I returned fire and got out of there. Um, that, that, that's like a, an, an exaggerated application of the statute here because the statute, I think what the commissioner was saying earlier would say that that officer still violated the statute mm -hmm. because even though it wasn't feasible, we could agree it wasn't feasible for the officer to go through that mental calculus the statute is unconditional and says, well, it says you shall take it into account. It's undisputed, you told us you didn't. And so you violated the statute. And so then does that subject the officer to discipline or um, if there's litigation about uh, negligence, did the officer, is this evidence of negligence because the officer did not comply with the statutory duty? So I think that's where it comes up. It's not whether it's feasible to know something it's whether and kind of time pressure decision making, which police officers encounter, but so do airplane pilots, so do emergency room physicians, so do many other professionals. It sort of recognize that in you know uh, time pressure decision making, you don't have the luxury. Uh, you know, time doesn't afford you to process everything that you know, um, and so. Um, so I think that's what I think that's what the concern was, um, and it seems to me that if everyone agreed it was not feasible for an officer to make this calculus, then on its face it would seem unfair for the statute to to, to apply nonetheless. So may I ask Julio a question about that? Sure. sure. So how what what language would you put in there to um, to change it? Um, well, I think you, you know, you had identified language earlier, uh, and I think um, some of the other witnesses here, like I think uh, Falco from ACLU uh, also testified about this, and, and I won't speak for him, but I, uh, but I think the, you know, the language that you had He's identified was like, um, you know, like the, the officer shall, whenever feasible, take that. Oh, consider that information. Right. When uh, determining, yeah, and it's and it is true that you will have to. Well, then there'll be some evaluation in a given case about whether it was feasible or not. But you will be doing that sort of intellectual exercise anyway, under the grand standard, because you're going to be thinking about the totality of the circumstances, which might include that the officer had a quarter second 
to react mm -hmm. or that their decision-making process might have been impaired by the fact that they got struck in the head with a two by four, as I think the, the commissioner had given the prior example. So, I mean, you'll be doing that sort of evaluation in any event. I don't think, I don't think it creates an additional burden. I think it just recognizes that um, th there may be instances where everyone agrees it's not feasible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Julio? Julio, any other comments for us? Uh, no, I think that I think that was um, well, that was it. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, we're going to take a well, we're going to take a ten minute break to twenty minutes of eleven, um, okay. and then pick up with Falcos um, from the ACLU. Um, I'm switching he and um, Pepper because Pepper no longer is with the state. He's okay. Thank been you. promoted, promoted or whatever to the head of the cannabis control board. Okay. Is he yeah. already? I believe.